different tools of monetary policy available to a nation's central bank for managing the level of interest in the economy and therefore influencing the level of aggregate demand. In a previous lesson, we introduced the money market, which we see here. The money supply curve represents the total supply of liquid money in a nation's economy. This refers to cash, checkable deposits, and savings accounts. The money demand curve represents the demand for money as an asset and as a medium of exchange with which to buy output or the goods produced in a nation's economy. In the same previous lesson, we also mentioned that the supply of money is not related to the interest rate. Rather, it is determined by the monetary policy of a nation's central bank. First, let's look at what we have here in this illustration we're going to use today. We've got the United States Federal Reserve, which is represented by the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke. Now, the Federal Reserve is the entire green box at the top of the screen. Within the Federal Reserve system, we have money, represented by $100 bills, and we have U.S. government bonds, represented by this orange bond certificate that you see here. Now, government bonds play a very important role in monetary policy, as we'll see when we talk about OMO, or Open Market Operations. Next, let's look at the commercial banks. Of course, most of the money in a nation is held not by households as a physical asset, rather in bank accounts, either savings accounts or checking accounts. So commercial banks, which we see in this corner, hold money as an asset and they hold bonds as an asset. Now the money held at commercial banks actually belongs to households. So that brings us to the households. In households, we see that, yes, money is earned in the resource market um, from our circular flow model in unit one of the course. And bonds are also, also held. Now, government bonds are a form of asset that households can invest in as a way to save money, just like putting money in a bank can be used for savings. So even though we're talking about monetary policy here, government bonds play a very important role. Government bonds are an illiquid form of asset. Government bonds, unlike money, cannot be used to buy goods or services. Therefore, if the central bank wishes to increase the supply of money, they can buy up some of the government bonds from households and commercial banks in exchange for liquid money, which can then lead to more consumption and investment in the economy. Now let's go back to the Fed and start talking about the different tools that the Federal Reserve or any central bank has for either increasing or decreasing the supply of money in the nation's economy. We'll start with the tool known as the reserve requirement. Okay, another term for this is the required reserve ratio. So sometimes it's known as RRR, the required reserve ratio. Now this is defined as the percentage of a bank's total deposits from households that must be kept on reserve at the Federal Reserve Bank. Now let's do an actual example here. If a commercial bank, that is a private bank, has total deposits equaling $1 billion, in other words, households have saved $1 billion at that bank, and the reserve requirement equals 0 0.2, this tells us that 20% of that billion dollars must be kept on reserve at the Fed. So this would mean that of the $1 billion, $200 million would be kept in reserve at the Fed. So what could the Federal Reserve, what could a central bank do to the reserve requirement to increase the supply of money? This is quite simple. In fact, lowering the reserve requirement, let's say the reserve requirement falls to 0 0.1. Now, Commercial banks must keep only 10% of total deposits at the Fed. If the reserve requirement decreases, what this does is this frees up some of these reserves from the Fed and brings them back into the banking system. Decreasing the reserve requirement means that commercial banks can lend out a greater proportion of their total reserves, which leads to an increase in the supply of money and a decrease in the equilibrium interest rate. So this would be considered an expansionary monetary policy. Reducing the reserve requirement allows more money from households deposits to be kept 
at commercial banks and not at the Fed. Now, money stored at the Fed, money that is required to be kept at the Fed, cannot be lent out by commercial banks. Therefore, a lower reserve requirement means that there is more money available to be lent out by commercial banks. Therefore, the increase in the supply of liquid money in the economy brings down the costs of borrowing and makes more money available to lend to households, firms, and other borrowers to help pay for consumption and investment. Reducing the reserve requirement is one type of expansionary monetary policy. Now let's go back to the original reserve requirement of 0.2. What if the Fed, what if the central bank wished to decrease the supply of money? One way it could do that is by raising the reserve requirement from 0.2 to 0.2 or 0.3 or 0.25. Now this means that of their total deposits from households, commercial banks must now keep 40% of those deposits on reserve. So banks now have to send more of their total reserves to the Fed, which takes that money out of circulation. There is now less liquid money available in the economy, causing the money supply to decrease, as we see here. And the increased scarcity of money in the banking system causes the interest rate in the economy to rise. Commercial banks will now charge higher interest rates to borrowers, therefore there will be less money available for loans to households, reducing the level of consumption and investment in the economy. Raising the reserve requirement puts upward pressure on interest rates since commercial banks have to store more of their total deposits at the Federal Reserve, taking that money out of circulation and reducing the money supply, raising the interest rate. Historically, the reserve requirement in the United States has rarely been changed. Most recently, it stands at around 10% or 0.1. In other words, commercial banks in the United States must keep 10% of their total deposits from households on reserve at the central bank. So the reserve requirement is a relatively unused tool of monetary policy. Let's move on to the next one, though. OMO. This stands for Open Market Operations. This is, in fact, the most regularly used tool of monetary policy by the United States Fed. This involves the U.S. Fed either buying bonds or selling bonds from commercial banks and households in order to increase or decrease the supply of money in the economy. Typically, the Federal Reserve will meet quarterly, once every few months, to determine whether or not it will buy bonds, sell bonds, or maintain the level of bonds that it currently holds. Now, what's the importance of bonds? As we said earlier, bonds are an illiquid asset. Bonds are investments held by households and commercial banks that earn interest, but they cannot be spent on goods and services. So if the Federal Reserve decides to buy bonds from households, what would that look like in our illustration here? To buy bonds, the Federal Reserve will give liquid cash, as we see here, in exchange for illiquid bonds. So bonds will go into the Federal Reserve from commercial banks and from households. If they wish to continue to increase the supply of money, they can continue to buy bonds from the public. For every $100 bill inserted into the economy, a $100 government bond is withdrawn. Now, as we can predict, an increase in the bond purchases by the Federal Reserve will lead to an increase in the supply of liquid money. So our supply of money curve would shift out. And since there's more liquidity in the system now, the equilibrium interest rate will fall and borrowing costs will decrease. It's very visual in our illustration here. As the Fed buys bonds from the public, from commercial banks and households, it takes an illiquid asset out of circulation and injects money into the economy. Recall, money held at the Fed is not part of the money supply since it can't be borrowed or spent by private individuals. However, as soon as money is injected into the commercial banking system and into the hands of American households, there is now more money to be spent. This will lead to economic stimulus. Households will be able to borrow money at cheaper costs. They will have more liquid money at their disposal. Therefore, they will go shopping. They will spend more of that money. So buying bonds is considered an expansionary monetary policy. When the Fed engages in an open market purchase of government bonds from the public, it leads to an increase in the money supply and a decrease in the interest rate and ultimately an increase in aggregate demand of the economy. So what if the Federal Reserve, what if the central bank wanted to contract the level of aggregate demand in the economy? What 
type of open market operation could be used to reduce the supply of money, cause interest rates to rise, and therefore lead to less aggregate demand. Well, predictably, if buying bonds increases the supply of money, then in fact it is selling government bonds that decreases the supply of money. Let's show how that would look in our illustration here. If the Federal Reserve started to sell bonds to commercial banks, then we would see money flow from commercial banks to the Fed in exchange for illiquid bonds. There is now less money in commercial banks to be loaned to households. In addition, if the Fed sells bonds to households, we're going to see bonds go into the pockets of households and money come out of the pockets of households. There is now less money in circulation in the economy. Therefore, the level of consumption and investment falls. A sale of government bonds by the Fed decreases the money supply, as we see here, and causes the interest rate in the economy to rise, as we see here. This is called a contractionary monetary policy. It is very regularly used in order to bring down inflation in the economy. Now, why does a sale of bonds bring down inflation? Because less money means less overall spending, less aggregate demand, therefore less pressure on prices in the economy. So why do households and commercial banks buy bonds when the Fed decides to sell them? It's quite simple. A $100 government bond that matures in 10 years might be able to be bought for $90 currently. That would give you an effective interest rate of just over 10%. In other words, you could buy a $100 bond for $90, wait 10 years, and get $10 more than you paid for it. However, if the Fed goes to sell those bonds on the open market, the supply of them would increase, and whenever the supply of any asset increases, the price of it falls. Now you may be able to buy that same $100 bond for only $80. This would give you an effective interest rate of almost 25%. Since an $80 investment now could lead to a $100 payment in the future. When the Fed sells bonds, the price of government bonds falls and investors find them more attractive since the effective interest rate on those government bonds increases. This is called a contractionary monetary policy. So we've just gone through open market operations now. If the Federal Reserve wishes to increase the money supply, they will buy bonds. As we see, bonds will be sent to the Fed. Money will be put in commercial banks. Money will be given to households in exchange for bonds. And the supply of money increases, causing the interest rate in the economy to fall. On the other hand, if the Fed wishes to decrease the supply of money in the economy, they can sell bonds, in which case money would be given back to the Fed by commercial banks and money would be given back to the Fed by households. There is now less money in circulation causing interest rates to rise, decreasing the level of consumption and investment. So that brings us to our final tool of monetary policy. The final tool of monetary policy is known as the discount rate. The discount rate is defined as the interest rate on short-term loans from the Federal Reserve to commercial banks. Now, why would a commercial bank want to borrow money from the Federal Reserve? Wouldn't a bank prefer to borrow from another bank in the economy? Generally speaking, yes, but the Federal Reserve is known as the lender of last resort. If a commercial bank, for example, at the end of a given day, does not have enough to meet its reserve requirement, it could be in violation of a federal law. Now. Typically, a bank will not violate the law. It will simply borrow some of the money it needs from the Fed in order to meet its required reserve ratio. So if the Federal Reserve lowers the interest rate that it charges banks for these short-term loans, this would make it cheaper for commercial banks to borrow funds from the Fed. So we would see the supply of money in the banking system increase, which, as we now know, causes the equilibrium interest rate to decrease. Reducing the discount rate makes it cheaper for banks to borrow money from the Federal Reserve, which makes it cheaper for households to borrow money from banks. So the discount rate, again, is the interest rate charged by the Fed for loans to commercial banks. On the other side, if the Federal Reserve wished to decrease the money supply, they could simply raise the discount rate. Now this would obviously make it more expensive for commercial banks to borrow from the Fed. Therefore, the supply of money would be less. Fewer commercial banks would be willing to make risky loans because it would cost them more 
to borrow money to make up their required reserves from the Fed. So the discount rate is the final tool of monetary policy. This is typically not used in an active fashion very frequently. The most commonly used tool of monetary policy is definitely open market operations. In a given year, a Fed may change its open market operations policy three or four times. It may decide to buy bonds if it wishes to stimulate aggregate demand. Although if inflation becomes a threat, it may begin selling bonds to decrease the money supply. So during recessions, the Federal Reserve or any central bank will engage in expansionary monetary policy consisting of bond purchases. Buying bonds directly from commercial banks and from households increases the supply of money and leads to increases in consumption and investment. During periods of inflation, a central bank will more likely sell bonds to households and commercial banks. This decreases the supply of money, puts upward pressure on interest rates, and reduces the level of consumption and investment in the economy. So that wraps up this lesson on monetary policy and the three tools of monetary policy. In a later lesson, we'll actually bring an aggregate demand, aggregate supply model into our analysis and we'll show more precisely how different monetary policies lead to changes in the level of investment and consumption and therefore employment, economic growth, and the price level in the economy.